Hark! Those uh, herald angels sang, Glory to the newborn king! Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. And with those angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. So, hey, it's Christmas week, our annual celebration of the birth of Jesus. As awesome as that uh, birth story is, I said to you last Sunday morning that uh, if the Jesus story had stopped at at just his birth, we actually probably wouldn't be talking about it um, still. So while, while we focus on the birth of Jesus at Christmas time, it really is the entire Jesus event that we celebrate at Christmas, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, uh, the whole package. And so in my Advent sermon series for you this year, um, we've taken one sermon to spend some uh, time looking in some detail at his birth. We took another sermon uh, last week to spend some time uh, looking in some detail at his death. And today we come to the part of the Jesus story that in many ways is the most vital uh, of them all. As as wonderful as the birth story of Jesus is, as world-changing as Jesus' moral teachings were, as awful and incredible as Jesus' dying story is it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that legitimizes and amplifies all those other things and launches the story of Jesus right past every other important and pivotal moment that has happened in human history into the number one spot. This resurrection story takes Jesus and and, and propels him past the significance of any human war or empire past the impact of, you know, the Industrial Revolution or the Age of the Renaissance, any of these things. It even moves him past the invention of the home computer and the World Wide Web. Resurrection is really the keystone of the claim I've been making to you in my Advent sermon series that the most pivotal of all important events that have occurred in human history is the Jesus event. So today, as part of our celebration of Christmas, we're actually going to look at the resurrection. And I'll be keeping to the same format we've been using in these other sermons, uh, which means that we'll start in with reading some of the resurrection story. Uh, Then we'll look a bit at how the resurrection of Jesus had been foretold by Old Testament prophets. We'll spend some time on the historical evidence for the resurrection, and then we'll finish again with uh, Three final reasons why I believe that you ought to believe that Jesus, uh, the Jesus event, is the most pivotal moment in human history. For our reading of the resurrection story, we'll stay in Luke. That's the book we've been studying uh, throughout this year. And uh, we'll turn to him for that. So, following Jesus' death on the cross, Luke reports to us that Jesus was buried. After waiting for the Sabbath day to pass, some of the women who had been Jesus' followers uh, came to his tomb and found it empty. A couple of angels let them know that Jesus had been risen. And we're going to start our reading uh, from where the actual appearances of the resurrected Jesus uh, begin. And this would be verse 13 of Luke 24, which says to us, That same day, uh, two of those who followed Jesus were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only person visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. And so they, uh, you know, they filled Jesus in on all the info. And uh, then Jesus said to them, we skip to verse 25, How foolish you are, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them then what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. 
As they approached the village to which, to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay, stay with us, it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While well, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They, there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, uh, Why are you troubled, and, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet, it is I. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that, that I have. And jump to verse 44. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written, that the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. They worshipped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Luke actually continues that story over in the book of Acts, which is uh, the second part of this work of his. And uh, over there in Acts, uh, he tells us that there was actually a time in between uh, these two, actually two different stories here. So uh, in, uh, there was a time period in between what we call Easter Sunday now and the appearance Jesus made to them there, and then that final ascension of Jesus back into heaven. Luke says it was a period of 40 days and that Jesus uh, appeared a number of times uh, over that 40 days to them. And some of those stories are found in the other Gospels. So this, the resurrection story of Jesus. So we just saw that Jesus spent some of those resurrection appearances with his disciples um, showing them scripture and how it had foretold all of these things that, uh, that he was uh, going to do, including his, his death and his resurrection. Uh, the passage had said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And he told them, this is what was written, the Messiah will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. So now we are going to do just a little bit of what Jesus was doing for his disciples back then, looking back at these Old Testament prophecies. Uh, we did this last Sunday, too, and, and looked uh, at, at some prophecies that the Messiah was going to suffer, suffer and die. And, and I said that those were surprising prophecies because there are so many other Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that said he was going to come as a powerful king who would reign forever. And so, you know, you scratch your head and say, well, how is a... This powerful saving king from God who's going to reign eternally, how is that figure also going to suffer and die? That doesn't add up. We know the answer now, of course, and, and that is that he was going to be resurrected after his death. So let's look at the, the two main prophecies we looked at last Sunday about the Messiah's suffering and death, and, and we'll look at them a little more fully now. Isaiah 53 had said this about the, the future Messiah. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, oppressed, afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter. For he was cut off from the land of the living. The Messiah was going to die. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And then here's the part we didn't look at. Last week, verse 10. But 
Though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. So he's going to be cut off from the land of the living, be buried. But now, verse 10, after his death, the Messiah is going to see his spiritual offspring and his life will be prolonged. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, it says. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. So that's how that prophecy ended up. The other big one that we looked at last Sunday was uh, Psalm 22, which was written as if the Messiah was actually speaking it. And uh, that passage had said, My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. My bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So how does that prophecy end? Well, if you skip to verse 24, it says this about that afflicted Messiah. But the Lord has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. So there too you have this uh, a, a Messiah laid down into the dust of death who then will be helped by the Lord and all people will shout about a great thing that God has done. Amen. So Luke, Luke said, um, Luke told us that the, the resurrected Jesus showed his disciples these things and then also that the prophets had proclaimed uh, that after the resurrection, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations. And I think we can be pretty certain that Jesus showed his disciples passages like these next ones in that moment from Zechariah 3. I'm going to bring my servant the branch, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Isaiah 49. God says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. There's a lot of other ones like this. And, and, and you know, uh, yes, as Jesus indicated, this kind of stuff can be seen here and there, hinted at all the way through the Old Testament, even back to the very beginning, like in this passage from Genesis 12, where God promised to Abraham that one day his descendants would, you know, they would eventually become a great nation, Israel, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Jesus opened his disciples' eyes to all of these things in Scripture about him, and their hearts burned within them. Okay. Well, over the last couple Sundays, I've told you uh, that no historian doubts that Jesus lived. He, you know, he actually was a real person, historical person, not imaginary. And uh, I, I've said to you also that no historian doubts that Jesus died on, on the cross. A thing that happened in, in real history. Um, today, though, we move into something that many historians do doubt. Many, but for sure, not all. And, and that is that Jesus actually was resurrected. What's interesting about this is that even among the historians who say that Jesus uh, you know, they don't believe that he came back to life. Even among those historians, there still is quite a lot of agreement about the historical truth of many of the aspects of the resurrection story, and I want to explain that to you today. And I'm just going to interject and say here, I'm going to spend a little time on this, and, um, you know, it, it gets a little deep. We'll feel like we're, feel like we're in school here today, I guess. Uh, but, but remember, the resurrection is the keystone to all of this, and possibly the most important event in our faith in Jesus as Son of God. Um, so it had better be historically true, right? So this, this material matters. If, if Jesus was historically born and historically died, but he was not historically resurrected, then we have a problem, Christ followers. <laughs> So I hope you can be patient and try to engage with this stuff along with me. I think it's worth it. 
In a book titled, Did Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? University professor and author Gary Habermas writes this. There are at least 11 elements associated with the death of Jesus in the days following his death that are considered to be knowable history by virtually all scholars, and a 12th event is considered to be knowable history by many scholars. And then Professor Habermas uh, lists those 12 events, and for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to whittle them down just a bit and relay eight of those things to you. So uh, here they come now. Uh, eight things that almost all historical scholars say should be considered uh, history. Number one, Jesus' death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope. The Gospel of John talks about how they were hiding behind locked doors when the resurrected Jesus first appeared to them. And that would have been a very natural uh, reaction and way for them to behave after watching what, had, what the authorities had just done to the man they were disciples of. Continuing on with the list, number two, uh, and this actually is the one that Professor Habermas said was not, not as universally agreed upon, but still many uh, uh, agree upon it. Number two, many scholars hold that Jesus was buried in a tomb that was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Number three, critical scholars even agree that at this time, the disciples had real experiences that they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus. That's a big one. Look at that one. Critical scholars even agree that at this time, the disciples had real experiences that they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus. Why would skeptical scholars say that? Well, you got to look at number four. <laughs> because of their experiences, number four, the disciples were transformed from doubters who were afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his death and resurrection, even being willing to die for this belief. So, because it is held to be historical fact that the disciples were transformed from being scared for their lives to very suddenly being willing to die for the proclamation of a resurrected Jesus. Even skeptical scholars will say that the disciples, they must have had some sort of experience that they believed to be the real resurrected Jesus. Well, that's a big statement. We'll keep going. Next one, number five. This message of the resurrection was central in the early church preaching. So it, it didn't, you know, this, is when the, this wasn't an attack on later on that, that got added on as some legendary idea down the road. The, the resurrection was a central part of the message from the earliest preaching in the church. And as a result of this message, number six, the church was born and it grew. Uh, number seven, James, the brother of Jesus and a skeptic, was converted to the faith when he also believed that he saw the resurrected Jesus. And last one, number eight. A few years later, Paul, persecutor of Christians, was also converted by an experience that he similarly believed to be an appearance of the risen Jesus. So that's all pretty amazing. Even historians who don't believe in the resurrection would say that the things on this list we just looked at uh, are historically very reasonable to believe. So why don't they believe in the resurrection then? Well, in the reading that I've done on on this subject, um, I think that the answer simply is that these people believe that human beings just don't come back to life. And so even though the disciples believed that they had had a real experience of a resurrected Jesus, these folks would say uh, that that can't be what actually happened. So I think that's usually what you hear skeptics like that say. Or or they'll, they'll say, miracles cannot happen, so anything that talks about a miracle in the Gospels has to be explained by some other reason or some in some other way. You know, so what do you think as you look through that list of eight things that most historians believe, even those who don't think Jesus actually came back to life? I tell you what I think. It sure seems to me that the only reasonable uh, conclusion to come from when, when you look at those eight events or all 12 of them that were in the book 
that most scholars say are probable history, the, the explanation is a real resurrection. And, and I think this kind of ends up feeling, uh, maybe you'll think this too, doesn't, doesn't this kind of end up feeling like uh, atheists trying to explain how life got here without God? Yeah? You see all this design, um, but instead of these folks choosing to believe the obvious explanation that there is a designer, instead they grasp for some other sol- solution, some other explanation. I think it's the same sort of thing here. These people look at, at all of that evidence for a real resurrection, but instead of deciding that there must have been a real resurrection, they grasp for some other explanation. I don't think we need to follow their lead. <laughs> You know, I've said here many times in the past, I cannot scientifically prove to you uh, that a designer exists. I cannot scientifically prove to you that Jesus actually rose from the dead. There are reasons you could cite to support a decision, you know, that there is no God or that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But I do believe that the evidence on both of those questions strongly falls on the side of what the Bible says is true. Belief in a historical resurrection is not an ignorant belief. And in fact, I would argue that it actually is the best explanation of the evidence. You know, I don't know if you get into this stuff. I, you know that I do, but uh, come, come, come see me about this if you have questions. There's uh, a lot more to talk about than you can fit in one sermon. I'd love to talk to you about that. And with that, we're on to our last agenda item for the morning's sermon. In each of these uh, Advent sermons, I have offered three reasons to you why I believe the Jesus event was the most pivotal moment in human history. Uh, Here then, and we'll get through this quickly, are my final three points for you to consider. Number one, Jesus represents a real, tangible communication from the Creator God to us. Jesus represents a real, tangible communication from their creator God to us. And and the resurrection of Jesus proves this, right? Skeptical skeptical scholars say that people just don't come back to life after dying. And, And that is our experience, right? That's what we observe. But maybe all that means for us is that if someone did come back to life, then that would be a person worth paying great attention to. And then if you mix in these facts, that the person we're talking about today of having come back to life just also happened to be the greatest teacher of morality that the world has ever seen, was someone who claimed to be the Son of God, was someone who just happened to go through lots of different experiences that fit prophecies written down hundreds of years before he arrived. Huh, well, that seems like a lot of coincidence. Why is the Jesus event the most pivotal moment in human history? Because Jesus represents the most solid evidence-backed communication from God to humanity that we've got. That's why real, tangible communication. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God, has made him known. Jesus is God's love letter to us. His communication. Second reason for today now, on on why Jesus is so historically important. I said to you last Sunday that that human beings have always had a feeling uh, within us that the world isn't the way it was supposed to be. And, and, And we said last week that the Jesus event confirmed that feeling within us to be true. I'm going to say something similar uh, to that now. I believe human beings have also always had a feeling within us that there should be something more than just life on this planet. You know, we all long to live on. We, We have this longing inside us for eternal life. So here's my second point. I, I would argue that Jesus' resurrection confirms our feelings that there has to be something more. It tells us that our longing for eternal life is there for a reason. Jesus confirmed that eternal life is possible. He was resurrected back to life, and that means it's also possible for us. 
There's a lot of talk about heaven in the New Testament, but even some of those Old Testament prophets got into this subject on occasion. Here's a, a prophecy from Isaiah. This one, not about the coming Messiah, but instead about the followers of God from Isaiah 26. Your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Resurrection is possible. Eternal life is possible. Jesus showed the way. Final point for the morning. You know, a historical resurrection really means a lot for us. And one of the things that it does for us is that it gives us tremendous reason to believe that the full message of the Bible is true. And so we're going to look now at the Bible's explanation for why Jesus is the most important event in history. The Bible says Jesus is of ultimate importance because Jesus came to a human race destined for eternal death, and he opened the way to eternal life. Human history pivots upon Jesus because he opened the way where there was no way. And he paid the price we couldn't pay. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, all those other uh, non-Jesus important historical events I've mentioned during this sermon series, they all had huge effects on life on this planet. The Jesus event affected life here and affected what comes after life here for billions and billions of human souls. And, And that by itself is, of course, more than enough reason to proclaim Jesus as the number one historical person and number one historical event of all time. All right, well, I'd like to close off my Advent sermon series now by uh, recapping for you all nine of the reasons that we've looked at over the last three sermons as to why I believe the Jesus event, birth, life, death, and resurrection, was the most pivotal moment in history. Here we go from sermon number one, my three reasons. The number of Jesus' followers has exploded into the billions since his birth throughout the earth, and Jesus radically altered the lives of those people for the better. Number two, the birth of Jesus proclaimed to the world that God cares about people, even those in the most humble of circumstances. And number three, the birth of Jesus brought to the world a real hope. Three reasons from sermon number two, last Sunday, as to why Jesus is number one historically. Jesus brought, Jesus brought the possibility of real peace to human beings. He taught us how to have peace with God, how to have peace with each other, how to have peace within ourselves. Number two, Jesus completely revolutionized moral thinking in this world. He radically changed the world. And number three, Jesus confirms that the feeling we have that the world isn't the way it was supposed to be is true. And this has brought us hope. And from today's sermon then, number one, Jesus represents a real tangible communication from the creator God to us. The resurrection proves it. Resurrection is key. And number two, Jesus confirmed our feelings that there has to be something more tells us that our longing for eternal life is there for a reason. And then number three, Jesus came to a human race destined for eternal life, uh, eternal death, and he opened the way to eternal life. And so, Calvary, hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us from the earth. Born to give us second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king.
Lord Jesus, we give you glory. We give you praise. In honor on this, another Christmas week. Another opportunity to celebrate all that you are, all that you have done. You've, revolu- you've revolutionized the world, Jesus. You revolutionized so many of our lives. And maybe there's someone here today who's just a step away from having you revolutionize their life this Christmas season. And I pray that that would, that that would happen. You're so good. We, we love you and we honor you today. Amen.